first of all, I've never worn a tie for the podcast, but <laughs> with my esteemed panel of guests on this podcast, as suited and booted as they are, I had to do this. Uh, we are here at the third annual Emmett yes, Smith yes, Charity sir. Golf Tournament, and I'm honored to be hosting this tonight uh, in honor of the 92 championship, Dallas Cowboys, 20th anniversary of the first of three Super Bowls in the 90s, the Dallas Cowboys, and I'm pleased to have the host of the event, Emmett Smith, good to see you, sir. You too as well. Your quarterback, Troy Aikman, good to see you, Troy. Thank you. And the playmaker, Michael Irvin, good to see you. Always my The host. triplets together on one interview. Do you guys often do this? Was it the Super Bowl? Yeah. Was it the 92 Super Bowl? The last time we really <laughs> the last time these three guys sat together for an interview. We've gotten together, I when, think the last time we together when Emmett went into the Hall of Fame. Can you believe 20 years have gone by? It is, it is amazing. Uh, it, it, it truly is amazing uh, when you think about the time that has gone by, but it has gone by like that. So time. Aikman back. He throws it out. Left corner of the end zone. He caught it. Cut to the right. Cut to the left. Oh, Touchdown. no. It couldn't have been thrown any better. Oh, great three. Michael Irvin scores. Emmett Smith breaking a tackle. in the end zone to Irvin for a touchdown. Oh, he's still going. It's hard for me to believe like seven years ago I was still playing and now it's 20 years since we had our very first Super Bowl and you know these guys here have families and I have families now it's, it's a little different life is different than it was when I was 22 <laughs> right so it's, it's way different now 20 years Troy since your first Super Bowl what does it mean to hear that number for the first time in my life I, I, I'm starting to feel like I am old <laughs> <laughs> Not because of the 20, just in general. So this hit, this didn't come at a necessarily right. great time, you know, for me. But you know what's interesting, Rich, is you're always told that there's a lot of life left when you get done playing football. And when you're playing, you don't you don't think of it really in those terms. I mean, you're just immersed in the playing and, and all that goes with that in your career. And you don't think about it, but there really is a lot of life left when you're done. And for that to have happened 20 years ago, it's hard to kind of put your arms around and say, gosh, we did that a long time ago. We've been out of the game a long time. And most people that are watching this don't remember 92 uh, and don't remember <laughs> watching this. <laughs> That's freaking me out. You know, what's interesting, though, is we, as we look back, we always thought, we're blessed, man. We're here talking about winning one and, and celebrating one. And we won three. But I promise you, it's not a Sunday goes by that I say, oh, we should have won five, <laughs> six, you know, and put this thing way out of reach. I don't know why. It's just every Sunday sitting on that desk with you, you know, you start getting those feelings again. I'm like, oh, I still believe we should have squeezed more out of it. Let's start from the beginning, if we can. You were there first, Michael. Yes. You were there first. What was it like when you first arrived with the Dallas Cowboys? <laughs> Well, you know, for me, first it was an honor, certainly, to be drafted by one of the greatest coaches to ever coach in this league, and Tom Landry, and, and to get here. Of course, you know, you're coming in as a young guy, not fully aware that at this level is different. You know, what I mean? <laughs> I'm thinking, I said, "Oh, I'll get there, I'll fix it, we'll go win some Super Bowls," and I got my head kicked in every week. We got our heads kicked in, and you know, I was crying, actually, really crying, and, and then the next year we drafted Troy. And I said, oh, okay, now I got me somebody. We're good. That's well, so all I need. Just give me the ball and I can go from there. We were getting our heads kicked in. But the good thing is I saw he was crying, too. It bothered him, too. So, so now we got something to work with. But then after we got in it, we were good. I felt like we were coming together. But when Jimmy brought in Norb Turner, I thought Norb and what he was doing, everything fit our talent best. Deep ball, left side, caught it fair, spinning away Irvin at the 15 to the 10, toward the goal line. Touchdown, oh, oh, oh Michael Irvin. Draw play, Smith up the middle, bounces at the 10, to the 5, cut to the right, cut to the left. Oh, no! Evan Smith. Whoa, yes! From that point on, we took off. What was your first meeting with Michael like, Troy, when you first met him? I played against him in college. In fact, was playing Miami when I when I broke my leg, which then forced me to transfer from Oklahoma and then go to UCLA, which really kind of jump started you know my entire career. And so, I went to Thousand Oaks. I was going into my senior year, and he, as he said, was drafted by the Cowboys. And, but they had training camp in Thousand Oaks, and so I went out there one day. I had some buddies of mine that were on the UCLA team that were now rookies for the Cowboys, and and I remember watching him 
And yeah, he's running around and, and slamming the ball and spiking it after a catch. This is in practice. This is, training, this, is, this, is, this is a training camp practice. All the things I thought about Michael from college were now confirmed watching him in person on the practice field. And I thought, man, this guy's the most arrogant SOB there is. You know? I mean, and then I, <laughs> I come to the Cowboys and you realize in a, in, a, in a real short period of time that, yeah, this guy is flamboyant, you know, he's, he's confident, but he's about the team and he's working his tail off. Michael had the personality and all the things that a lot of current players and former players would be criticized for, but he had the work ethic to go along with it and was the hardest working guy. So I loved him from day one, you know, and you know, we weren't very good, you know, my first year and Michael got hurt. But then here comes Emmett, you know, the very next year. And I played against Emmett in college uh, in the Aloha Bowl. And some teammates of mine, when they got out of that game, man, the toughest guy we've tried to tackle in all the years here in college was Emmett Smith. And so we knew he had, you know, talent. Now, do you think he's going to go on to be the all-time leading rusher? Right. You know, no. But we felt that some things were starting to come into place. And then, and then with Norv, he was the guy who kind of just – pulled it all together as the architect that made it happen, you know, and all three of us at one point or another have said that without North Turner, none of us would have gone on to do what we did. Which one do you think is the most impressive? I think the very first one. As a young man, we all aspired to that moment. Then to play up against one of the greatest teams like the San Francisco 49ers out there on the road, it was an amazing, amazing experience. So Emmett, you've got uh, Michael who arrived first. And then when Troy comes in, the all-time great Tom Landry gets the axe. Jimmy Johnson comes in. You didn't do very well that year as well. You now enter this equation. What were your thoughts coming off the campus at Gainesville entering this situation? I was so excited just to be drafted by the Dallas Cowboys because this is the team that I've always wanted to play for as a young kid. I didn't even think about the 1-15 season until I got here. Mm -hmm. And then once I got here, I saw what Jimmy was trying to do. The one thing you have to do when you have a great leader like Jimmy Johnson and many others out there, you absolutely have to buy into the system. You have to really give up of yourself and the way that you think about certain things and give it a shot. And for me, I was cool with it because Jimmy reminded me of my high school coach, Dwight Thomas. And so my father said something to me the day that I got drafted. He said, son, y'all gonna become a very good team. He said, you got a quarterback, you have a wide receiver, you gonna have an offensive line and you will become a better football player because of that. Uh, my father is not a man of many words, but when he makes statements, he makes some profound statements. When he first got drafted, or Emmett came in, now I was, you know, I look back, I'm embarrassed. I came in with the big old gold <laughs> necklace and I'm talking about everything, but Emmett came in with them MC Hammer pants. <laughs> right? And he was, I mean, I was like, who is this dude right here, you know? Okay, they're talking about me, but what is this? Mike, that, what was, runs like this that, was, that was before my million dollar contract. That's what it is. That's you had. Season, he called me. That's what he called. He called me out this, I guess, what, 91 season? We had a pretty good season. He it, led it was after, uh, the after Russia, Detroit. The first year with Noor. Yeah. And he's driving home from Dallas to, to, his, to, 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 to Pensacola, to, Florida. He, he, called, he called me three in the morning. Hey, man. I said, what's up, E? He said, man, I'm just driving home, man. I'm just going to tell you, man, we had a great season, man. We're going to do it again next year. Three. I said, E, what are you talking about? E. I said, E. It's three in the morning, man. I said, yeah, I'm just excited about it. I said, E. You're in the pros. Nobody drives home. Take the flight. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing, man? That's what that, that's him, man. He drove his car home to Pensacola, Florida. I don't know what's more surprising about that story—that you were driving yourself home, or that you were awake at home. three in the morning. You were home, home asleep home at three in the sleep. morning. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't know what I don't know what's more of a surprise. Awake at three a.m. Awake at three a.m. That's not a surprise. Yeah, no. Home at three a.m. Home at three in the morning. I don't know what's more. Why do you think I call him at three? That's right. I knew I catch him. I just got him up. I knew my head was fine. If it was eight or 11 o'clock in the morning? No. 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 You got voicemail. Straight to voicemail. Uh, before we get to the championship seasons, Jimmy Johnson, you guys talk about how, you know, somebody comes up to you and sees, knows you're a football player from the longest yard and knows maybe even you from dancing even or you from being a broadcaster without knowing the full breadth of your Hall of Fame careers. They see Jimmy Johnson, he's that guy in the gray hair on Fox, just chilling out, right? He's sort of like a chill sort of presence there yeah. on, on the studio set at Fox. What was Jimmy Johnson like? as a head coach. He was very demanding. Uh, the, the guy I've gotten to know, you know, after he got out of coaching, 
is, is a far different guy than the one I knew uh, as the Cowboys coach. What I've learned is, is he's still the same guy. I think if you look at the history of the game, you know, who the great coaches are, by and large, they're guys that were you know, pretty tough guys, demanding, difficult to get to know. Jimmy was all those things. And, and he would tell you that, that one of the reasons why he got out of coaching when he did was that he was tired of being the bad guy. Well, he was so good at it. You know? <laughs> he was excellent at being the bad guy. <laughs> and not once did I ever think that he didn't like being, being the, the bad, bad guy. guy. You thought he enjoyed being yeah. the bad guy. And then when you're around him now, when you go see him in Florida, you realize that that's not him. The bad guy is not Jimmy. Jimmy's the guy, he's the life of the party. He's the guy laughing and cutting up and having a good time, wanting to make sure everybody else is having a good time. So he <laughs> did what he needed to do for us to win. And I think that part of it too was that he was trying to prove himself and there was a lot of pressure on him. So it wasn't like it was, it was all uh, out of character for him to be that way. But he was the right guy for us at the right time. <laughs> and uh, Jimmy went out there to win and wasn't afraid of uh, the consequences of making a tough call. I have this vivid image of uh, Jimmy right now, just chewing the players behind out, then walking out of the room with his back turned to everybody else and going down the hall laughing his behind off. <laughs> really? Because, yeah, I, I just had this vision because this is what he had to do in order to get everybody in, 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 in the position that he wanted them in. One of the moments I remember uh, in terms of a confrontation with Jimmy was my rookie year. We were having a two-minute drill, and we had to call timeout. And I caught the ball, and I knew it was first down, and I knew we spiked the ball in time. And Jimmy called timeout. He was mad. He was walking out to the field. And I'm walking up. Coach, I caught it. First down, et cetera, et cetera. No, get your butt into the hole. He embarrassed me in front of my teammates. And I was mad at him for about two days. Then one day we passed the chase and said, you still mad at me, huh? I'm like, yeah, Coach, why are you going to front me out like that in front of everybody? He said, that wasn't for you. He said, I wanted everybody on that football field to know if I can get on one of my best players, that the rest of them, don't have a chance. And I understood. I said, point well taken. And I knew right then and there that I'm like, OK, I got you. I understand what you're trying to get accomplished. Jimmy is about order. And when you bring, when you bring order, everything works smoothly. I didn't know that until times after he was here. And, and you know, mm -hmm. and things weren't as orderly. And then you start recognizing the gifts of Coach Johnson. The championship years, which one do you think is the most impressive? I think the very first one. The 92, the one that we're here to see. I celebrate. think the very first one, there's nothing sweeter than that yeah. very first one. Jimmy Johnson's taking his team from the absolute worst to the absolute best. How about them, Cowboys? Yeah! Think about it. None of us has actually played in the Super Bowl. And I can almost guarantee you, as a young man, we all aspire to that moment. And we've all went through the ranks of life to get to the National Football League, let alone to go through a 16-game schedule, then, then the playoff schedule, then to play up against one of the greatest teams like the San Francisco 49ers out there on the road and win that game to, to have the honor to go play in our very first Super Bowl, it was an amazing, amazing experience. My heart could not stop beating. I felt like I was about to have a heart attack. Back to back, that's impressive. And then you do it again after not making it. I mean, that's I pretty impressive. Too. 90, 92, so, I mean, we, 91, we went 11 and five and made the playoffs and won a playoff game and and so that was that was a good season to come off of into the 92 season you know we went 13 and 3 and and obviously had an excellent regular season uh record and played good ball and but we didn't really we were still young i mean i was in my fourth year michael was in his fifth emmett's in his third and we we're the youngest team in football and so we knew we were good but we really didn't know how good we were i know when we went in to play san francisco in the championship game you know, they were the veteran team. Joe Montana was still on the team. Steve Young was starting that year. I didn't even give any thought to winning the game. I just thought, hey, we'll go out and play, and whatever happens, happens. You know, but the thought of going out and winning that game never even really entered my mind. It was just Is that right. Then, you know, the game ends, and it's coming to an end. And I remember then thinking, wow, oh, we we're going to go to Super Bowl. Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it never hit me. That, it never really hit me that if we win this game, we're going to the Super Bowl. And then it, that made that year really special. And it made it special for all the fans in Dallas. I mean, it wasn't until five or six years down the road that we really looked back on that 92 team and yep. we say, well, we were loaded. Yeah, loaded. we were loaded with players. And, uh, and we didn't know how good we were. Let's get into the craziness. Off the field stuff, changing coaches. Everybody kind of just said, hey, we're going to sacrifice a little individually. But the guy telling us that and the owner of the club, they couldn't do that. 
How do you feel the current state of the Dallas Cowboys is? We need Felix Jones to step up because we know DeMarco Merrick can make it happen. That's a true statement. The Cowboys addressed what they needed to address. Somebody that can put points on the board on defense. That's the bottom line. Let's get into the craziness. Off the field stuff, changing coaches, all the stuff well, going on. I think on. that the, the chemistry of it all began to change, you know, because, you know, the argument of Jimmy and Jerry, that, that can go on forever. I mean, they write books about that. That's fine. But for us, Jimmy was the guy we answered to. Well, when that changed, then, you know, everything started changing a little bit. And we, you know, we started to slide a little bit. You know, Michael was talking about uh, the demands of Jimmy and what he expected. When you start to lose that edge, however slight it is, you know, then uh, then there's that other team who is hungry and they're gaining that edge. And you they're, know? Looking, so, they're looking for that crack too yeah. in the armor. When I point back to those years, the thing that Jimmy would always say to us is, at Pro Bowl time, there was always going to be players who felt that they had Pro Bowl years but didn't get voted in, right? Jimmy would always talk to the team and say to the whole team, hey, I know some of you are disappointed. You felt like you deserved to get into the Pro Bowl, but hey, if we achieve what we want to achieve as a team, there'll be enough credit to go around for everybody. And the reason we won three Super Bowls, Emmett, myself, Michael, Daryl Johnston, Darren Woodson, Charles Haley, go through the whole list of guys, everybody kind of just said, hey, w w okay, we're going to sacrifice a little individually. But the guy telling us that and the owner of the club, they couldn't do that. And that's the disappointing thing to me, that that's what was preached to us, and yet the two guys who really ran the club, uh, they couldn't, unfortunately, you know, put their differences aside for the betterment of the team. But it was a major palpable difference with Barry Switzer. It's an unfair, it's, it, 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 I know, it wouldn't I, matter if it was Barry or anybody else. The, the just problem a matter is, it just wasn't Jimmy. Is well, how do you take over a team that just won back-to-back -back Super Bowls? You know, no matter what you do, I mean, he was caught in, an, in a really a no-win situation. And, and that's not me being diplomatic or anything like that. It, and it's not a slack on anybody else. It's just that, for lack of a better way of announcement, we were Jimmy babies. We were his babies. I got you there. Boom. You know I let you do that. I don't want to embarrass you in front of the home crowd. He grew us. He knew how to make us. He, he had me since I was really a pup. And I'm probably the one that needed all the guidance, the most guidance. So. You know, it just speaks to what he was. I think the unique thing was that that year when Jimmy got released for whatever reason it was, I think it sent a shockwave entirely throughout the entire team. But not only that, but then when Barry come in and Barry's just saying to you now, it's a total different philosophy. I expect you guys to be men and I expect you to handle your business like men. And like Mike saying, a lot of us probably couldn't handle that from a maturity standpoint, so the rope itself got a little longer. Players got, got a little bit more leeway. And the focus was a little gone. Uh, we were more uh, distracted in a way or not as committed in a way. But when we lost in that NFC Championship game against San Francisco, I think the focus came back. Well, it became something that it, no, we got to prove exactly, that we are who we are. Exactly. And, and, and I think we, we got led and couldn't do it by us. So now the, the focus changed from that standpoint. Yeah, all right, now we'll show you guys that we can do it. Because I, I know, I remember that pain. Yeah. And everybody's saying, oh, I guess they're, guess they're not what they are. It was all Jimmy. And now I was like, well, wait a minute now. Wait, <laughs> okay. And the fight was between Jimmy and Jerry. Now you're going to exclude the work we've done, too? <laughs> wait a minute. So, uh, I so think, you know, that, that next year we got a chance to get on I the I think field. we got refocused. Yeah. And it hurts so much to see that San Francisco team in Miami. Oh, that killed when me. We, when we, oh, when we felt yeah, like yeah, we yeah, should have yeah, been yeah, in Miami with him. Oh, sure. I mean, that's what my, my MVP. I got <laughs> we felt like we should have been in Miami for him. He got his in L.A. I told him we can't come to Pensacola. <laughs> Atlanta was the closest we can get. Yeah. He got his in Atlanta. I was supposed to get he mine in, in that Miami. year at home in Miami. And when that did not oh, happen, I, I think I think <laughs> the focus changed. <laughs> it changed. And we wanted to prove it to ourselves. How do you feel? the current state of the Dallas Cowboys is the direction of the team and where you think it is headed, Emmett? I think Jason Garrett is the guy for this team. I really do believe that in my heart. I think Jason is trying to implement some of the things that uh, we learned from Jimmy. But I also believe that he has a talented enough offense right now in terms of the wide receiver core, from Miles Austin to Dez Bryant and, and Jason Witten and, 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 and some others. But then when you look at the running back core, I mean, they have two good guys. 
Now, do we need Felix Jones to step up? Because we know DeMarco Merrick can, can make it happen. We need Felix to step up a little bit. That's a true statement. At the end of the day, Tony Romo is the guy, and I think he should be the guy for this ball club for a long time. I like the way he has matured into the position. Troy, your thoughts? I know that to win, you've got to have a, a great quarterback, and I, and I believe that Tony Romo is that, and, and I know what the criticisms are. I know that he has to, to win in January before you know people really put him in the elite status, but until you do that, there's always going to be those questions. And, you know, he had a great year last year. I think that's the concerning thing to me is that you think about how good he played last year, and yet it still wasn't good enough for this team to make the playoffs. That, that's a concern. But had they have won the last game of the season against the Giants, then they would have been in the playoffs. Now, I don't know that they would have gone on and won the Super Bowl, but that's how fine, you know, the line is between winning and losing and winning a Super Bowl, you know, in this league. And so... We seem to say this every year, but I expect them to have a really good year. The Cowboys addressed what they needed to address in this draft, and that's get somebody that can make plays to put points on the board on defense. If you look at the Cowboys over the last few years, offensively, they've been doing enough to get in the playoffs and win playoff games. You got guys now get to the quarterback, and you finally got somebody that can make a play on the ball and take the ball back the other way. And I think that's what they've been missing the last few years. They just haven't had interceptions and turnovers from that secondary where they can go back and help with the, help the offense put points on the board. That's the bottom line. For the full audio of the special triplets edition of the Rich Eisen podcast and all the archived material, past shows, pictures, and more, go to the blog page richeisen.nfl.com Next week on the Rich Eisen Podcast we stay in the NFC East. Namdi Asamoah of the Philadelphia Eagles in our Los Angeles studio. Same with actor Billy Bob Thornton. That's next week. But as for this week I'm hearing the crowd getting a little bit louder outside. Which means it's a party about to be starting a dinner for me to host and for you to enjoy with your family, everybody here for your charity work. Thanks guys for sitting down on the podcast. Really Thank appreciate you. it. That's yep. Michael Irvin. That's Troy Aikman. That's Emmett Smith. That's the triplets. And you are Here. Rich Eisen. Signing off. <laughs> <laughs> it says it right there. That's right there. It says it right there. Podcast. Podcast. Podcast.